we do have uh, a longtime collaborator, uh, Sarah Ramsey, um, and we we're just saying we believe this is her third or fourth or something um, user conference presentation. So she's been uh, very active um, in the community for a long time, which is great. She's at uh, Fred Hutch um, just here in Seattle. Uh, we also have Emily Silgard, also at Fred Hutch, and Adam Rauch, um, who is a, a late substitution for Tony Galoon, who's uh, stuck in San Diego with the uh, with a broken foot, he very much wanted to be here to present, um, but I'm sure Adam will do him proud. Um, so, Sarah? All right. Um, thank you guys so much for having me here. I'm super excited, as always, to come to the Lab Key User Conference. Um, I am going to set the stage a little bit for the presentation that Emily will be getting into, and then um, something of a demo from Adam, and then I'll end up with a demo of some of the Lab Key software that we're using called Argos. So there'll be a fair bit of switching back and forth. Um, so first, I kind of just want to let you guys know who I am and what I do. Um, you may or may not be aware that Fred Hutch is part of an overall cancer consortium in partnership with UW, Seattle Children's, and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So we are strictly the research arm of the consortium. We do not see patients at Fred Hutch. Um, the patients are all seen at these institutions, which um, so you can kind of see that Fred Hutch doesn't own the medical record software, and that's just kind of one piece of complexity to this puzzle. Within Fred Hutch, we have five scientific divisions uh, and a centralized admin division. Um, my original experience with LabKey software was building a software platform that we called Atlas, and it was in the vaccine and infectious disease division. Um, and I have since moved on to centralized admin IT to help form an informatics department as a central resource to the as Fred Hutch. We have three groups working for us. We have a program operations group, analytics and data systems, and application development. So we do custom uh, applications, and we move data from many, many systems into many, many other systems. And then we have operational staff that kind of coordinate and oversee uh, the day-to-day -day operations of that group. So one of the main systems that we've been building, and, and largely this is the brainchild of Paul Fern, who is in the audience today, this is the Hutch Integrated Data Repository and Archive. So a large comprehensive database of patient medical records with the goal of combining tumor genetics and molecular data. Um, this is really the plumbing uh, to move the data amongst all the consortium partners. Um, and to be also a data resource for the entire consortium. So um, now we actually have established the Hutch repository. Uh, researchers are eligible to ask for us for, um, or ask for data sets from us as a resource. It's not something that existed previously. Um, so here's a conceptual diagram of what we're building. Um, so our main data source right now is from the UW, UW Medicines Clinical Data Repository. They use an Amalga or Caradigm system, if you're familiar with it at all. Um, and we basically go in, so they see patients of every um, malady or issue, you know, and, and we go in and we carve out the cancer patients based on a bunch of algorithms and based on diagnosis codes and whatnot, and then we transfer them over, and that's how we establish our repository. Um, we haven't yet coordinated data with children's, but that's next on one of our goals. And then where there are other places to add data into our repository, um, the cancer surveillance systems, existing archives. So the Hutch, in a way, is kind of like a commune, or sometimes people call it a shopping mall. All the individual researchers kind of have their own little niche, and they've done their own solutions for a long time. My job is to centralize and provide centralized support for these researchers. So there's a lot of... Um, one-off solutions throughout the institution. Um, so we're kind of trying to evolve away from that into a more centralized and supported infrastructure. Um, from our HydroCore repository, we create data cubes. And some of these data cubes actually go into uh, <laughs> upstream systems, Argos and Casis. So Casis is, I'll talk about it in a second. Um, these are the two systems that are currently being fed data from Hydra. There are other systems. We're actually in the process of um, specking out a CTMS as part of the consortium. That will take many years to implement at the, in the consortium. And then other downstream um, or other systems that would receive data as well as individual researchers. Right now, Hydra has about 300 and maybe a little more than that, 350,000 total patients' medical records in it. 
um, 800 million rows of data, 300, 400 gigs of space right now. This is largely just the clinical data at this time. Um, lab chemistries, encounter events, diagnostics is the flavor of what's in there. <clears throat> we, two, we use two application tools to facilitate access to this data. The first is CASIS. CASIS is an open source software system that does um, single patient view of medical record data. It's largely used for abstraction of medical records for research. Um, but it's really one patient at a time. It allows you to go in and it um, was originally cancer focused, but it, I think it has a broader audience than that now. Uh, but it does have a really nice model for modeling cancer data. So we've actually used that to receive data from Hydra because previously all the researchers at the Hutch were hiring abstractors and abstracting medical records uh, by hand. So right now we are doing the first feed of about 54 fields of data into CASIS. We then turn that data around as it gets added to by an abstraction team and then um, bring that data up through Argos as well. So Argos is the piece of software that we're building with LabKey. It's a self-service self -service reporting interface. The goal here is really to let the researchers get their hands on the data themselves. So it's really direct access. Our idea is that they're going to be, be able to answer some of those most straightforward, easy questions through self-service, but would always, in the long term, um, rely on a team of data analysts to provide data sets to answer the more complicated questions. So, you know, how many breast cancer patients do we see a year? Um, how many breast cancer patients between the ages of 40 and 49 who are women? Easy. Argos. How many breast cancer patients on this type of medication from this stage to this stage of cancer diagnose that, that you start to see the need for an analyst at that point? So that's what we've been working and spending a lot of time on. These are the data elements that we're feeding in, the first 54. There's lots more to come, but we focused initially on demographics um, and some diagnostic and lab data. Some high-level pathology data, but what we're going to really talk about in a little bit is how we're using natural language processing to take those pathology notes and parse them out into discrete records. So this is kind of an overview of the systems today, what I previously described. SCCA, UW, moving over, carving out our cancer patients. Our analysts can dig right into Hydra to get the data from, for the researchers, or it moves into CASIS and Argos for self-service and direct access and interacting with the data on the research team and researcher side. So in the future, and what we're really here to tell you about is this piece of feeding the data out to an NLP abstraction pipeline and then back in to the full abstraction tool and then on into Argos. So I'm gonna turn this over to Emily and she'll cover the problem and our implementation of the solution. Thank you. Um, so one of the main problems with scaling up getting researchers access to all this great clinical data is that really the majority of it, somewhere around 65 to 80 percent, is in unstructured form, right? It's in clinical narratives. Um, and manually abstracting all that clinical data for all our historical patients, all the current patients, all the future patients, um, is really time and resource intensive and just ultimately isn't scalable. Um, so, if you haven't seen a clinical narrative before, this is kind of what I'm talking about. This is an example of a pathology report. Um, I kind of grayed out all the protected information, and I just went through and underlined and read a couple examples of things that an abstractor might go and read through the record to try to extract, these kind of elements that someone might want. So, um, adenocarcinoma is the um, specific histology this patient had or was in the specimen. Um, down at the bottom, there's some tumor staging information. So PT3 indicates the size of the tumor, and PN0 means there's no involvement in the lymph nodes. These are all really important data elements for research. Um, and presently, they're not really being captured in a discrete way. They're being written up in narratives. Um, a slightly different type of report. This is a medical oncology notes. These both came out of EPIC, I should say. Um, uh, so this was written by a medical oncologist in clinic, patients in front of them. Um, you'll see I underlined pretty much the same elements. They're in a slightly different format. Um, there's a whole lot of other information there, though, because this person's talking about the entire patient in front of them, not just the specimen. Um, and mainly I just wanted to point out that there's, they both have um, kind of varying structure. Not only do they actually technically have different physical structure, because they come out of different source systems, um, but the, the information flow and the discourse in the document is um, fairly different. 
Um, so there are efforts to implement templated notes, so things like tumor staging, maybe you should just be able to enter that in discreetly instead of dictating it or writing down a narrative form. Um, but changes in clinical workflow are often really slow and difficult to adopt, I'm sure as you can imagine. Um, and although templating will provide access to a lot of discrete data elements, I think in the future, uh, I don't think it's reasonable to think that a patient's entire clinical history, their social history, their family history can really be properly expressed through a series of drop-down menus, right? It's the reason that we have human language to begin with. Um, so I think it, specifically in the area of clinical natural language processing, we have a few barriers that I think have limited the development a little bit and, um, and usage across the domain compared to um, kind of like broad domain like Newswire or the blogosphere. Um, and really, it all traces back to the necess necessity to, uh, to protect all that private data. Um, so that means there's pretty limited cross-institutional um, cross collaboration. I'm like, where's that arrow? I can't read. Oh, you guys don't have one. Never mind. Um, and uh, <laughs> there's really few annotated data sets um, that we could use for training systems, training algorithms, and also to use for benchmarking. Um, we have kind of insufficient common conventions and standards and terminology. Um, and a fair amount of overfitting to very specific applications or specific institutions. And there have definitely been some data sets and collaboration encouraged by shared tasks. So uh, I2B2 is a group that um, pretty much annually at this point does a natural language processing shared task and a bunch of groups come together from different institutions and um, try to build some systems to do things like extract smoking status or de-identify reports. Um, but the results of systems um, have had kind of limited carryover into industry uh, and I kind of think one of the reasons for that is that oftentimes the first pass maybe isn't deemed good enough to just throw into production right away. Um, so what I saw that we were kind of lacking was a way to use a first pass that maybe wasn't totally perfect but could be improved upon and use some manual workflow um, to help improve those automated processes. So there are some existing natural language processing toolkits available. Um, there's some commercial options. They do tend to be kind of black box designs. So um, you don't generally have a lot of um, allowance for, for future development or improvement over time. Uh, there's quite a bit of open source toolkits, um, even specifically within the biomedical domain and clinical, uh, but they tend to lack support um, for setup and implementation. So you'll find they require this really specific knowledge and skill set um, to set them up and customize them to fit your needs. Um, none of them that we saw were really optimized to our specific needs as a cancer research center. Uh, and most importantly, none of them provided a single platform for automated processing, for manual abstraction, and, um, and tracking of that information, storing it um, all on an enterprise scale. So our strategy has basically been to try to join those automated and manual processes. So we're designing this clinical data pipeline, along with LabKey, um, that will serve as a platform not only for information extraction with natural language processing, but also um, verification, um, manual verification after the fact. And so by using this manual abstraction workflow that we already have, we can iteratively create larger training sets for natural language processing corpora. We can decrease the time and effort of existing manual processes. Um, and eventually increase the volume and variety of, of data that's reaching the, the researchers and administrators. So this is um, kind of a high level overview of, of the architecture. We've got those raw reports, the um, pathology reports that, that I showed you before, the um, clinic note in Hydra. We'll push them into a staging um, table. And then LabKey server will hand off those documents along with various parameters to the um, natural language processing engine. The output from that was into another staging, which right now we're pushing downstream into cases, but could go into other, other downstream data storage or um, back into Hydra. Um, so this is, uh, this is a workflow engine diagram, so I know there's a lot going on here, but I think um, I'm going to walk through just a couple kind of scenarios, and I think it becomes a little bit more clear. Um, so the first scenario, I think, is where we don't have any natural language processing algorithms yet. We don't have any training data. We don't really know what the answer is, so we can't, we can't mimic that human behavior yet. So we can do this task assignment step, assign abstractors to, um, and maybe even two or more abstractors to look at the same document or set of documents, the same task, um, have them abstract from those, those documents, compare the abstractions um, and the resulting data elements, and potentially you know, review those, maybe adjudicate if there are any discrepancies, have another person decide. Um, 
and then compute some statistics. So this kind of helps us create a really great gold standard. It gives us um, some performance metrics or like you know what we can try to um, hope to attain with natural language processing. So the second workflow is, hey, we already have some, some natural language processing algorithms. So we're going to start processing pathology reports, maybe pull out some, some of that histology or the tumor grading information. So we go ahead and run the engine. Um, but maybe you want to assign an abstractor to verify some of those documents. It could be maybe just like a random selection, or maybe it's based on um, the observed or the, um, the confidence of some of the algorithms themselves. Um, and then again, we have an option to review those abstractions, um, review the results, and compute statistics. So these statistics would be more aimed at um, the performance metrics of the algorithms themselves. So the design of the natural language processing engine itself is hierarchical, which kind of allows us to customize parsing for different document types. It's like the pathology report I showed you before um, has a very different parser than the clinic notes that come out completely in blob form, have totally different section titles and totally different el data elements discussed. Um, and then the algorithm design itself is very modular, which should account for more extensibility over time. Um, so we can put in new parsers if maybe the um, there's a, the source system changes the, the format of the raw documents or um, put in new algorithms when we have more training data or when there's new research questions. Uh, so this hopefully is a s somewhat clear picture of what I tried to just describe. So this first step in the hierarchy, that first tier, is um, per, per document type. Um, and so we have different parsers for those document types, and then maybe a set of general, um, general modules or algorithms that are applicable across all disease types. So something like uh, a specimen size is not really going to vary much whether or not it's breast cancer or lung cancer. It's going to look roughly the same in the pathology report. Um, but then within that, we might have disease-specific modules and resources, maybe ontologies, um, or specific algorithms that maybe are only applicable to certain disease sites. So the big picture is basically we're going to try to use the automation to speed up manual work, and in turn use that manual workflow to improve on the automation iteratively over time. Um, and I'm actually going to turn it back over to Sarah. She's going to talk a little bit about the logistics of the project itself. Um, so what you're looking at here is the overall hydro program schedule that we're working on. And I just kind of wanted to draw out that this NLP algorithm development effort is really just one component of the overall effort that we're working on. A lot of time and energy spent on moving the data. I kind of breezed over it earlier, but the um, data comes from the medical record systems through parsers that are written at University of Washington that are then dumped into their clinical data repository and then transferred over to ours where we reassemble them. So you can imagine the state is going through lots of iterations that passes through the systems. Um, where we did an initial set of data feeds, we have identified 20 data types that we want to get from the University of Washington's clinical data repository. We went live with 11 of those data types in there, so demographics, labs data, um, a few other types um, in November. So that was really the opening of our repository. Um, and then we actually went live with the push of that discrete set of 54 elements from Hydra to Casus and ultimately Argos in June. So that was the kind of the full uh, life cycle of the, platform, of the pipeline. <clears throat> we continue to build on our core repository, adding more data, um, advancing our analytics tool sets beyond just the self-service modules, but looking into things like Tableau and other kind of advanced tool sets for our team. Um, and then at the same time, we're building the self-service program, um, Argos with LabKey. We did a brain pilot, so I think last year there was a talk that um, Paul and I think Eric Holland gave about the pilot we did for the brain group. And just this year, we moved beyond the pilot phase and just opened a few weeks ago to the, our first full disease group, the thoracic head and neck cancer group, um, cancer groups, to be honest, um, at the Hutch. So we're really just entering the most exciting phase of the project. At the same time all that was going on, uh, there were interns and staff, people doing research into NLP algorithm development. 
um, and doing disease group pilots. So just trying to see if we could develop algorithms on a specific topic that could be effective. At the same time as they were doing those pilot programs, they were designing, storyboarding, and specifying what an overall pipeline engine might look like. We are now in this phase right here where we have the NLP prototype um, that we're going to demo. Well, I don't think we're going to do a full. Demo. We're going to. It's a, a demo. PowerPoint demo um, today through um, that that is active. And we've actually done our full, first full push of the data from Hydra all the way and in through into Argos um, with this data. And I'll show you at the end what it looks like in Argos. Um, and then we'll be moving on. This spring is our goal to have 1.0 of that pipeline available so that we can expand to multiple data types and document types. So how do we do it? So remembering that these numbers reflect only a small portion of the overall pie, the whole um, Hydra effort, including all of that, is you know, roughly a seven-year, 20 million, 10 million, Five. sorry, <laughs> five-year, $11 million project. Um, this component, roughly 1.25 FTE annually from LabKey and developers test and admin program management staff working with us. And then at Fred Hutch, um, Emily, our NLP engineer, um, a frequent interactions with our abstractors who are most experienced in this data, um, project sponsors, myself and Paul Fern, and a project manager, and the interns as well participating in the work. Um, so we are going to do a demonstration in two parts. So I've talked a little bit about this upstream part, getting data into Hydra. What was developed for this prototype were the ETLs to move the data out of Hydra into the staging environment. Then LabKey server comes along, grabs them, pulls them into the server and the engine for processing, and then pushes them out to staging, where we then push them from the staging environment into other systems like Emily mentioned, cases or um, up back into Hydra as a repository resource. Um, so just one more look at what the data looks like. This is, again, Emily showed you in the medical record what it looks like. This is what it starts to look like when we get it in the database in Hydra. Um, and this is what is pulled by ETL into the staging environment for retrieval by the lab key system. So I'm going to turn it over to Adam to show his demo. My demo. Demo. Yeah, so it just, uh, we had a little uh, AV problem here being my laptop the rest of this. So uh, I just snapped this together uh, while everybody else was talking. So hopefully I, I covered most of the uh, most of the capabilities here. Um, so I should apologize. I'm not Tony. Tony should actually be up here doing this presentation because uh, he's done a lot of the development, especially on the pipeline side of things, along with uh, some of the other developers and, and testers at LabKey. So I will, uh, I, I pale in comparison to Tony, but I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, all right, so what we're seeing here, so I should, uh, we should make it clear that this is all a work in progress. Um, so in particular, user interface and other pieces are still being developed. In fact, um, a couple of bugs were fixed just a couple days ago to make this demo possible. So thank you, Ian, for that. Um, so UI is still being worked on and, and some of the functionality, but we just wanted to kind of show you that that middle piece so again there are etls there's a whole workflow um, that surround natural language processing to provide high throughput fault tolerant uh, pipelines of data and this is just one piece so what we're going to show here is kind of that that middle piece and how you might as a developer or tester um, or if you're emily how you might test out your algorithms within this pipeline in sort of a manual process so typically this is automated but we're so showing kind of a, the manual process. It also makes for uh, a better demo. Uh, okay, so we have um, uh, this standard portal page. We've got uh, data pipeline and NLP reports being shown here. If I click on process and import data, I see the um, standard uh, import or file, uh, sorry, the pipeline web part. Um, which allows me to browse around and select a, a document of interest. In this case, I've got that sample file that uh, Sarah was showing. So we select that and click Import Data. And then number of, of possible providers. I'm choosing uh, NLP Pipeline um, and Import Results. 
And this is the point where I specify some of the parameters around um, this particular abstraction, automated abstraction. So I've got a couple of options like um, different protocols. So for instance, if I'm testing or developing different versions of an algorithm, or in, in this case, I'm sort of simulating, uh, we don't actually have the support yet, but you know, simulating if I used a different open source NLP engine or a commercial package, that's how they would get plugged in here via a different protocol. So with each of those protocols, you specify some properties. And I'm not sure if you can read those, um, but they're basically, um, so I've got a clicker here, yeah. So we've got the version of the NLP algorithm. This is basically a, a directory that contains the code. Um, there are a couple of parameters that get passed to that engine, and then um, some another parameter that the pipeline uses. So all of this is, is kind of wrapped up in an analysis protocol that can be saved away and rerun over and over again if, if desired. This is then once, once I click, uh, once I submit that, um, the pipeline runs. This runs very quickly. Um, and this is the, the resulting output, which basically uh, shows that we've called Python with the particular script, with that version of the script. Um, we've extracted the data, extracted the fields, and sent them into the database. And then if I go and look at that report, um, this is what I see. So on the right hand, on the left hand side is the report itself. And it's not showing all that clearly, but um, you can see there are some gray, gray highlighted fields here. So every one of the gray fields is a, a text element that was identified by the engine as being interesting or relevant. Um, over on the right hand side, you see all the fields that were extracted by name, their values, and a confidence score. And then importantly, as you uh, hover over or highlight terms in either on either side, they'll get highlighted on the other side. So for instance, uh, we're clicking on the right-hand side, colorectal, and saying, well, where did that come from? And indeed, over here, we see colon and colonic. Um, and also, if we hover over that, we'll see a start and stop uh, point in the text here which uh, I think Emily likes a lot when she's uh, developing the algorithms and trying to figure out why things are, are offset incorrectly. Uh, if I click on, for instance, pathologist, um, it'll scroll down to where that pathologist is actually highlighted there. So that's, that's where that was found. And then in this case, so that was just viewing. So you might imagine in, in one particular workflow, you have the NLP engine extracting this data and perhaps a human would review those results and approve them or not. Um, this is sort of another mode you can go into, which is I'm going to view the results and potentially change them or add to them. Um, so very similar view, but just with editability and the ability. So you can see here I've added a couple more fields or filled in a couple more fields based on values I, I see down here. And I can highlight in here or highlight in multiple places and assign that to this particular field to tell anyone else who would look at it, this is, this is why I think it's 15. Here's, here's the data I used to make that conclusion, or zero, or whatever. And as I said, we're working on the UI here still. There are, you know, there are currently drop-downs with um, specific values. There are drop-downs where you can enter new values if you want to. There are free text and numbers. Um, we're, we're, still working. we're still working on that. Um, these fields, though, are all, the, the list of fields here are all um, output by the NLP engine. So the engine says, these are the fields that are valid to extract from this type of document. And then LabKit itself picks up those fields and dynamically generates the appropriate forms to allow you to enter or, or modify those particular fields. And I think that covers it. Sorry, that covers it just for me. And now we'll <laughs> go back to Sarah. We I know. I think you guys kind of missed how much effort we put into de-identifying all those screenshots with Simpsons data. The pathologist was Ned Flanders. Yeah. Well, I guess we didn't even really need to do that because the resolution. yeah. Anyway, so what I'm going to end up doing here is switching over to my laptop to show you guys now that the data has been processed through. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to go to that slide real quick before I switch over. 
Um, so this is the pathology results in cases. Now this is real um, patient information, so we've redacted the PHI um, to show it to you today. Um, but here you're seeing some of those same elements that uh, Adam was highlighting through the text. Um, this is the tool that abstractors can use. In addition to what we're building with LabKey, they can add more data in here. The tool with LabKey really focused on specific document types, whereas CASIS, again, covers the whole medical record. Um, so all this information, um, path ascension number, site, side, results. Here's some staging data um, from the pathology results below. And what I'm going to do now is switch over to show you how we actually see the same data viewable in Argos, but will facilitate that aggregate um, interaction. And I'm going to demo on the screen, but my laptop doesn't show it, so I'm going to try really hard to do the right steps. All right. Oh, and I have to reset the VPN connection. All, of course, all of our systems are protected behind a firewall, so... Oh, yeah, this is a disaster. <laughs> Why don't you turn it? Sarah, can I ask a question? Uh-huh. Sure. Please yeah. do. Um, so what kinds of documents have you used as sources for that? Uh, so that's kind of a question for Emily. Um, so the pipeline, the pipeline and the ETLs and things that we built are fairly generic. Um, so they're, they're, I mean, that's really how we always do the, the pipeline. So in theory, any kind of document could be, could be a source for an NLP extraction, and then you know, any engine could be run as a part of that process. So that's what the analysis protocol allows you to do, specify where that is and parameters that will get passed. Um, and Because ultimately what the pipeline is doing is executing an executable on the command line. So in this case, it happens to be uh, it executes Python and specifies the top-level script that Emily has developed. Um, but in theory, it could be any executable of, of any kind. Um, so that's really how it's, how it's designed. I mean, at the moment, we're very focused on just this engine and just that invocation. So at the moment, you know, it sort of automatically uses Python um, because that's what we know we're going to be running. But in the future, it could be, you know, it could be anything. So in that, I don't know, Emily, do you want to talk to the format of the, you know, the current format that it's, it's using. Yeah, I mean, I think it, you could be absolutely any document type. Um, <laughs> really old document type, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't deal at all in, um, in scanned in documents. We're just talking about text files of some sort. But the whole point in having like that first level parameter being the document type is that you might know that yeah, you have this big blob, but maybe you also have some other metadata with it. So you want that fed in. There's a very specific structure. Is it tab delimited? Is it, you know, I mean, these are things that you would know if you house these documents, hopefully. <laughs> but they might vary by, you know, a few different, a few different types. So. All right. So I'm going to log into Argos. Um, one of the best features we've developed in Argos with LabKey is the ability to enter the portal in a de-identified mode. So I'm able to look at actual patient data, but that's been... Um, dates have all been offset and all PHI has been obscured, so um, nobody's at risk here. Wow, I entered my password three times with no mistakes. <laughs> all right, so right now we are just configured um, for four disease groups that I mentioned we just rolled out to our head and neck and thoracic um, group. We do have an all patients portal. We have about 115, 118,000 patients available through these disease groups, you have to understand a lot of, a pretty significant amount of patients end up with multiple cancer types, so they'll see the same patient in multiple portals. Um, and so this is kind of, I'm going to actually just jump into the thoracic portal, because the patient um, in question that we've been looking at today, um, while they're a thoracic patient, they also, and the specific pathology has to do with colon cancer, but they're still going to show up in there. So what you probably can't read really well here is that we have five or six different purposes or activities that people are allowed to enter the system with. These are all permissioned. So uh, when people apply for access to the system, I say we can negotiate with them whether or not they have the right to see um, for research activities or healthcare operations, quality improvement. And all of that kind of governs your interaction with PHI. And this is about the regulatory environment that we're working in. So um, largely, most of our users will enter under research. 
Um, I'm going to enter under the Hydra IRB file uh, that I have very much memorized. And we log all of this information. So whenever a user enters the system and looks at PHI, the administrators can quickly turn around and say, who saw what patient and what did they see, or at least what did, um, data types did they see for that patient and what date and under what IRB number. Um, and if any of you have ever gone through an accounting of disclosures experience, this is going to be a huge lifesaver for my team. So really excited. Another permission control feature here is that this is the drop down for PHI levels. I have full permission, so I can choose coded, limited, or full. Today we'll be doing just the coded view. And then we enter into the portal. I know people are going to pour over those terms of use, print them out. So right now is loading a basic dashboard. The dashboard is shared across the disease group. It's a quick view into your patients. We are in our staging environment, so you have to acknowledge this data is a little stale. That's why we don't have any activities in the past 30 days. Um, but in the past 12 months, this graphic here is configurable per portal. We have it looking at demographic age groups. If you click it, it resets the, the screens over here and kind of gives us summaries of the activity of data in these areas. Um, we also have a My Links. We have saved grids and filters that people can go back to. Um, if all else fails, we'll be going back to the NLP demo view in a little bit. Um, and then we're going to move over and just a few other things to call out. Here it is also reminding me of my research operations IRB file number and then I'm in the coded no PHI view with all dates masked. Um, now I'm going to move, oh, and then also we have 18,614 thoracic patients. And I'm going to move into our patient's view here. <clears throat> and what you're seeing really is the, an interaction with a lot of the kind of basic structure of the CASIS data model that we're using in Argos. So this is a little bit about how that CASIS data model organizes clinical data for cancer patients. Um, you can look at demographic information, diagnoses, imaging. Right now, most of the data is where we're feeding in the Hydra data. There has been abstraction efforts at the Hutch. So in pockets, there are patients with fuller data sets. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of spottiness in these data sets. That's something we're working on right now. Um, so I'm just going to dig in a little bit on gender. Say I was very interested in finding um, this pathology report. I happen to know the patient was a male. So you just click on the elements you're interested in and it automatically starts filtering down. So I'm down to 9,000 of the patients that are male, and this is my filter. Um, I can change to other filtering methods. Um, I'm gonna, you know, there's a lot of different options in here, a lot of different ways to find the patient groupings that you're interested at. Your filters, you can save them all, you can return to them later. You can always reset, drop all your filters and start from scratch. Um, I'm gonna go into the pathologies and I happen to know that it's not just the male, but I want the adenocarcinomas, so I'm going to pick it out. Um, I think it might be a little interesting to show you that right now this is showing me of my patient set, about half of my pa adenocarcinoma patients are male, right? So there's the full set available, 540, and my subset is 308. So I'm going to click on that, and down to 308, and I'm going to save this filter. And that actually really subsets my whole worldview down to these patients. So now I've dropped down. And I can keep filtering beyond here or keep looking. But I mean, we have many, many other features, but what I'm going to quickly jump to to show you the results of Emily's work is the View tab. And this immediately pops up a column chooser, and this is really the point at which researchers can have direct access to the data. So they might be interested in looking at some demographics, basic data, age. We know the gender based on our, our filtering, but you can include that information. And I'm going to scroll down and choose from our pathology table some of the elements that are currently being processed in the pipeline. The histology itself. Um, think site. Um, Pathologist are all elements that are coming through there. And then just click OK, and it starts to build this grid view of data for me. <clears throat> now, what's most interesting in this case is actually to see the NLP results. And maybe this may seem a little um, 
anticlimactic, but I know that the patient that we were looking at is And there we have the results of the NLP algorithm that tells us the sites that were pulled out of the report, the pathologist, the histology. And yeah, the end of the demo is two lines of text. But <laughs> <laughs> this is just so the, the, the potential for increasing the throughput um, of abstracted data in our environment with, you imagine, 335,000 patients. A really skilled abstractor could abstract a patient in forget this at like five hours and that's a really skilled abstractor um, so uh, the 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 potential that we see with these algorithms in this pipeline is really going to have a huge impact on availability of data to our researchers at the hutch in a way that's never been imagined before so that is the whole demo and our talk um, Adam and Emily can come back up if anybody has any questions There's a thank you slide too, but it only says thank you, so it's not that exciting. I'll say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's better than the slide. Um, and I just want to say real quick, you're saying like the last, the end of the demo is two lines. Um, because we kind of chose to follow one report through the system from beginning to end, but in reality we ran like 1,500 through. So there are other lines, which is not really interesting to see a whole bunch of lines. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> And the questions can be about Argos, too, or any of Hydra. It doesn't have to yeah. just be about the NLP pipeline. I'm happy to. So the question that I have is about the NLP, the NLP engine that you're using. So you guys are uh, writing the NLP engine by yourself, uh, and would it be included within the LabKey software when you make it available? Uh, it's open source right now, so it's, yeah. it's up on GitHub. Um, yes. and it's and yeah, it's developing. It. <laughs> I'm writing it. Yeah. There's pieces up on GitHub. Um, yeah, so right now it's a, uh, for now that pathology, um, all the pathology modules are, it's purely Python implementation. Um, we might, I know I said before that, that as far as the open source toolkits go, none of them is like the exact perfect solution, but there's a lot of little solutions there. So some of those open source toolkits can be part of that pipeline as well. It's, it's pretty flexible. Do, do patients have any access to any of this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, certainly down the road, and it, has, it is a little bit complicated with the way our consortium is built. A lot of the patient interactions don't happen at Fred Hutch. They happen in the hospitals. Um, SCCA itself has a um, kind of a virtual patient environment that they're working on, um, but it's not really related to this. So this is driven mostly from making available the data to researchers right now. Um, like adding a completely new document yeah. type? Well, you have to build something to parse it and not knowing, I mean, if it's just like, hey, you just have one random blob text file, then you can slurp it in and push it out and have people start abstracting on it. Um, if you have kind of a complex table structure that just has some raw text in it in different places, then you need to put a little bit more work into parsing it. But. Answer, not answer, sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the, oh, this is going to be a really loose metric, so don't quote me, or if you do, don't tell them who you heard it from. But um, generally what we're doing is approaching problems that if a researcher identifies the need to have abstracted data on 100 or more patients in their study, we're going to engage them about building a natural language processing algorithm. If their study is 100 or less, it's true that Roughly, an abstractor can beat the development of an NLP algorithm. Very rough metric, but that's kind of what we're working on. I was thinking of perhaps another stage which would be to the opposite, where before you've got the abstracted data, you've got the raw things, and then try and see how good the abstraction was. So, so we do do those tests, and Emily has done those. You can maybe talk about some of the recent ones you've done. Analysis of abstracted results versus the NLP. So there's, there's a couple ways that, that goes, right? You can mm -hmm. review um, abstractions and, and maybe use an algorithm to do QA yeah. um, to look for just kind of anomalies. And, and you can use people to do QA and algorithms. If you start throwing all those in the system together, it just kind of iteratively gets better and better. And you can make lots of families of all the abstractors. You can potentially put on a 
<laughs> I will say that some of the community engagement with the abstractors, and this, we kind of talked about this a little bit in the adoption work breakout session. Um, the, I think the important part here is that we are here to accelerate their work, right? So keeping them engaged because it's not, without them we can't build this, right? But it, it can be perceived as a kind of a, a threatening thing. So it's been, there have been some tense moments. Yeah, I like to think you're just making their job harder, not taking it away. Um, because there's still like lots of really, really complex problems that mm -hmm. I might come nowhere near trying to write an algorithm to extract in my lifetime. But I just don't think that we can should have people do kind of like the boring mundane stuff. Like no one should have to read through a thousand notes to find one mention of smoking status. That's something the computer is really good at. But if you, you know, if you need someone to weigh evidence and a whole lot of specific medical knowledge from like a handful of different sources, then they're going to be much better at that. This is incredibly exciting. I mean, one, the primary use case is to essentially automate the abstracting process, but it seems like what you're able to do is to extract the data from these pretext notes you know, or from uh, pathology reports and put it into a structured format. Uh, and to me, that sounds like even more exciting is once you get into that, that new queryable sortable, cubable, uh, mm -hmm. you know, analytic data source, you can do all kinds of other things with it, mm -hmm. surfacing relevant information for particular types of patients. Yeah, exactly. Is there potential to use any kind of machine learning technique to yeah, and, that, and that's the like one of the, the biggest impetus behind having this, this manual workflow built in is that um, when I came to the Hutch, there was just really limited training data. Um, so there's, you know, I came out of this great master's program in computational linguistics and learned all sorts of awesome machine learning algorithms for really well manicured perfect data sets, and I couldn't use any of them. Um, so <laughs> um, a lot, so I, you know, it's, it's this balance between doing, yeah, doing, doing a lot of really like, simple, not necessarily very sophisticated things, and building in the infrastructure to create the ability to do things better and better and better. So the idea is by having people not just abstract and have the answers in one place and the raw text in the other, is by linking them and actually literally linking strings and having them annotate the text bit by bit that we can build up better training data and use better yeah, algorithms. Yeah, I think the maybe we glossed over it too quickly, but the page where Adam shows the actual editing of the results is that that's the place where that data that we're capturing as an abstractor is reviewing it and adding even more discrete elements is like cyclical to improve the algorithms and we think that's going to be pretty exciting. Okay. Thanks.